I just thought of, um, I'm not going to quote too much Shakespeare, but Shakespeare said, uh, this is no flattery. These are counsellors that feelingly persuade me what I am. Sweet are the uses of adversity, which like a toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in its head. Anybody like to expand? <laughs> Can you say that again? Yeah. <laughs> What we might do is move on to our second question. Yeah. <laughs> Craig, you're, so, you're, asking, just, you're asking us to follow the Dalai Lama, quote, quoting Shakespeare, building on his quote, and also following Russ Harris. I think that's a big ask. That's right. <laughs> but I think in many ways, I mean, it's a topic that's been with us uh, since the year dot, that in some way um, that adversity is not pleasant in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, but it can teach us something about ourselves. And I think, you know, my view is that Shakespeare's saying something about that, that in some way the precious jewel in its head is what we can learn from that adversity. And uh, so we've all had professional training and so on. I'd just be interested in, in your own reflections about what is the greatest teacher? Is it what you learn in your professional training? Is it what you've learned from your own experience? Um, and if so, what are those lessons? Anybody interested to explore that? I think it's always what you uh, what you learn in your you know in your personal experiences, isn't it? We certainly have learned a whole lot about what might be the case, what should be the case, or what the textbooks say in our professional training. But what actually happens in life and the people that you work with, um, both in well for me, my staff, but the people we work with generally in the community are the people that I learn most from. Yes. So you learn from your own experience, but also you've learned a lot from the people from around other people. You. So your experience and who you deal with, what works, what you see in people or you hear in maybe some of the lectures at this conference. I think you always get something out of everything you listen to. Uh, that's the point of life, isn't it? Just yeah. continuing to, uh, to become maybe um, more resilient based upon those learnings that you get. Yes. Like, because you've had a, a life in politics as well. So did you have to learn did you get schooled in resilience before you went into politics or was that the school of hard knocks that uh, taught you? I tell you what, you should have a, have a course in resilience when you go into politics. Politics is a fascinating thing, you know, and I'm sure you'd all agree with that um, right, right at the moment. But um, the thing about politics is that um, bad stuff happens, not occasionally, but every five minutes. So mm. if you're looking at uh, resilience, if resilience is about uh, dealing with uh, crises or hiccups or things that don't go quite right in your life, that's usually a couple of times before lunch, a few times after lunch, and then the, the evening news, absolutely, definitely. Mm. So one of the things I suspect you learn really quickly in, in politics is that, first of all, you can't take things personally. But most importantly, you've got to stay true to your, um, to your belief structure. Yes. The moment you go away from that, um, you're swimming, you know, you've got nothing to hold on to. So I think some of, you know, from my perspective, what I learnt in, in the political space is that you had to be able to put, um, I suppose, bad things aside, focus on the positives, um, and look at what you could really do to, um, I suppose, achieve the things that you're in politics for, and that's to make a difference mm -hmm. in the lives of the people that you represent in line with your policy directions. Mm -hmm. So you really have to put the bad stuff in a box over there, yeah. otherwise you'd go crazy really quickly. I'll just throw this open. It was mentioned about not taking things personally, and there's been mm -hmm. quite a lot of talk about labelling, being able to stand back from experience. Is that a very important part of learning to um, turn... Uh, adversity into learning wisdom? I think there's a key word reflection here and, yeah. and that's, uh, that's the point at which mm -hmm. uh, a lot of wisdom occurs. I think we have these aha moments and point, no, moments of clarity and what our <laughs> learnings are. So often in that sea of emotion that goes swirling around grief or loss, mm -hmm. um, adversity, that's when um, there's a great opportunity to have that positive spin on it, to, to come out of it with wisdom, with um, some nuggety truths about how to live life better. And I think that's the, the challenge for us all, really, is to, mm -hmm. to, to learn from adversity mm -hmm. and take it forward with us. Is that sort of reflection a little bit like, a, like the water that gets all stirred up, but it's hard to see what we're looking at? Is reflection, do we actually learn most from those moments when we're quieter, stiller? Well, I and think so. Is that time when we can in amongst all of that go to a still point where we learn? Yeah. 
I think there's a tranquility amongst, amongst the storm. And uh, there are, in Linda's contemplative corners of, mm -hmm. of her classrooms, or in that, that third space that we talked yeah. of yesterday, that's a place where you can really stop and reflect and become wiser and move forward with a slightly different perspective on the world. I remember um, studying with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, um, a well-known person in Death and Dying, and I remember her telling me at one point um, this concept of the only way out is through. And, and uh, she even had a poster in her uh, office that uh, was a mountain where there was a road cut out. And I think what happens sometimes with adversity is that we convince ourselves we can go around the mountain. And we get over on the other side and we say, I'm, I'm definitely okay, I'm really fine. And I think that it's this reflection and this willingness to stop uh, to really integrate how fine we are that is, is the, the gem, is the, is the pearl that I think we're talking about. And if that doesn't happen, then, um, then it's not gonna help us in the next time we might face some of those very similar things. You know? So it really has to do with, for me, this real time of integration. You know, and as one of my wonderful teachers, Angela Sarian, talks about, you know, that you don't have a story of woundology around what happened to you, but that you create a story, that it, anything that happens to us becomes a story at some point, and that in that creation, it, it begins to give us meaning behind it. Does it make a lot of difference how when we're talking to somebody about our day, <laughs> this event in our lives, does it make a lot of difference how somebody speaks to us in response to that? Because uh, does it help somebody to just, ah, oh, that is absolutely you know, terrible, and uh, just actually mm -hmm. to jump into the quicksand with us? Or mm -hmm. is it helpful to have somebody who's actually yeah. able to stand back and yeah. reflect, uh, draw out the learning in a different way? Yeah. Well, we, we teach a lot about being what's called a compassionate witness to people's adversity and pain. And that is a very neutral but loving place um, so that if one visits the pain, one is not re-traumatizing themselves, but is really visiting it for a deeper meaning and understanding. And uh, we do a lot of that work with teachers where um, they're, in, they're in pairs and, and they're asking questions of the other, but seeking to know, not because they're curious, but seeking to ask the kind of creative questions that help the person begin to make sense out of their story. And that happened a lot after 9-11, where you know, teachers had to hit the ground running and be there for kids. And it, in some cases, they hadn't ever told their own story of that day, of the turmoil they went through, that they didn't go to their own child's school they didn't know how safe their own child was and they were there for other people's children. And it took, in some cases, two months to be at a retreat to finally be able to have the time to actually tell their story. Yeah. Todd, have you got any thoughts? We've been talking about learning from our professional or personal experience. Yeah, I've got thoughts of on everything so far. <laughs> the, um, I mean, if, if you, just picking up from what Linda said, I think if you think about, so one thing we know is almost nothing is really powerful at predicting resilience because there's so much variability in how people respond. One of the, one of the places where, the two places that are the most profound is you're talking about social support and her, how, what kind of relationships are helpful for cultivating resilience in children and adults. And you could think of three different, three different spots. Safe havens, secure bases, and what Ed Diener talked about yesterday, capitalization supporters. So secure bases, the idea, fitting with what Russ Harris was talking about, I could be vulnerable, I could cry, I could be upset, and I know I'm not gonna be judged and evaluated. Mm -hmm. So I can have the softer side of me. And it's gonna, you can create relationships that kind of can cultivate that space where you can be sort of softer and gushier. S safe havens is the notion of, um, I ran a depression clinic in New York for quite some time, and a lot of people that came in, particularly women who are depressed, often the, the origin was a problematic relationships, and when they came out of that depression, 
or were starting to come out but still had this disorder, they were changing. All of a sudden, their partners and their children had a problem with them because basically no longer were they, when they were told, listen, we're going for Chinese food on Tuesday, and they said, no, actually, I want pizza. And they're like, well, what's this? When do you make a decision in this sort of, all of a sudden they have, they have choices and they're making, they're autonomous and they're making moves. And a safe haven would be a place where you have social relationships will allow you to evolve and change. And that's a hard thing. Most relationships, we like them because we can, they're predictable places, they're safe, they're secure, they're stable. And this is saying, if you evolve and change, I'm going to accept that growth because I'm constantly evolving as well. And this final, this is what Ed Diener was talking about, is we think the action is, during difficult times, you'll be there for me. But if you get stage three cancer, if you get a flat tire at three o'clock in the morning on the highway, people come out of the woodworks to help you. But when you have a baby, when you end up getting a Distinguished Achievement Award, when you end up nailing a sales deal, when you end up becoming the CEO of a company, who really is interested and, and is, wants to hear more about it and ask questions genuinely, not because something's in it for me two stages down the road because I know you have more money, resources, and power, but because I'm just intrigued. So if you have relationships that don't have those qualities, you have to really think about whether you need to discard people and kind of find new people to fill in the gaps. Yeah. <laughs> where, where do you find that you go when you've um, uh, had times in your life when you've been meeting with challenges and uh, building your own resilience? Yeah, for me, so for me, I mean, it's, it's, I don't make it that much of my story, kind of what Linda was talking about. I mean, my mom passed away when I was 12, my father worked out when I was two, and I remember going for interviews for clinical psychology PhD programs, and professors would say, you're supposed to be in jail, you're supposed to be a drug addict, you're supposed to be in some kibbutz somewhere in Israel, just kind of, you know, just having relentless sex all the time. Like, what are you doing here as a scholar? And the notion of, the assumption was, if you have these severe problems, you're destined to have this difficult path. And so for me, I've cultivated what I call my wise counsel. I've collected my own family over the course of time of just friends that have those qualities, secure bases, safe havens, capitalization, support. And, and it's one of the reasons I keep coming back to Australia. Russ Harris is one of them, and I've got like 10 more people that are here. And um, that's the meaning of life, is having that support, and that's the origin of of the ordinary magic of resilience comes from having those, that sense of stability and connection and security. It sounds, it, it sounds a little bit like that, um, the mindsets we were talking about yesterday. You had a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset. This is my experience, that's going to be the end point. Sorry, Katie. Um, I was just going to say, isn't it important though to have people that help you move on? Because it's really easy to um, wallow when, you've, you know, when you're having issues in your life and have people who are really supportive is really important. But then to have the capacity to have people to support you to set goals, to start moving um, forward and uh, hopefully up and away from that, from that um, space is really important too. And that's, that, that would be, those, are, those would be my safe havens. That would be, yes. And so the secure base are the ones that provide support. The safe havens are like, time for you for your Homerian odyssey to go on. Mm -hmm. And when you come back as a changed person, we'll embrace you despite you, we don't know what you're gonna be like. It's really mm -hmm. important not to end up as a victim, isn't it? It's really important to be able to, um, I suppose, get on with it, to, to, to really feel that, that whatever bad thing has happened, um, you can learn something from and go forward and not for the same thing to happen again, um, mm. hopefully, or you'll deal with it better and wi more wisely the second time around. Um, I, I think there's a lot of metaphors for life. You know, life is a road, it's a journey, it's a river, and they all have a, a sense of movement and um, endless flow. And um, so we don't want to be in a stagnant pool or we don't want to get completely stuck somewhere in our life's journey. I'm thinking of the cartoon yesterday of the, the little blip on the wandery yeah. path. Yes. Um, we don't want to get stuck at that blip. Um, and I think um, around this word resilience, it's, it, it's a very similar word to the word grief, but grief does tend to keep you stuck in a place. You know, it's a sort of a, has a rather a negative connotation because it's a negative emotion. It kind of holds you in, you're, you're grief stricken and you're frozen with grief. But I think resilience has got a much more positive kind of uh, frame that it puts on this situation that we're talking about. You know, I am resilient, I am strong, I'm standing tall, I have vision, I am moving forward. So people with that kind of narrative in their heads are much more resilient in terms of adversity, and whether they've learned it 
previously or through good schooling or through their friends and family. That's the important uh, part. It's an interesting thing because the stories, storytelling uh, is very important. It, it, there's this area in the brain called the default mode, the default network. Uh, sometimes I believe in the psychology literature is also called a, the, uh, the narrative mode. It's the, the mode that's telling stories. We tell ourselves a lot of stories and a lot of them are very negative. I'll be, just throw it open to the group for whoever's interested. But is this some of the ways in which, say, things like mindfulness can help? We keep going yes. down the same path, the same story. Yes. Mindfulness can make us aware of it, but also have a way of unhooking mm -hmm. from that story and re-engaging. Yeah, very Linda? much so. I was going to add, uh, beside the different things we're talking about, which I would call external to ourselves, um, and all good things, that we also have this power to um, deposit in what I would call our bank account of inner resilience. And uh, one of the ways that we are teaching kids to do that, and adults, is to find that relaxed, alert place inside themselves where their physiology is really different. And of course, some people are doing it through the mindfulness route, other people are doing it through other ways, but really the concept being that if we could deposit some of that inner resilience into that bank account, then in ourselves, that centered, wise place inside ourselves, if we could nurture that and cultivate it, then uh, we have it access to us. You know, the 11 principles on that day had to make a ridiculous decision of their lives, and they would normally be able to call a supervisor, but all the cell phones stopped working, and then their plan for uh, emergency was to go to the nearby school. Well, they knew the nearby school wasn't going to work, so all 11 of them went to this very, very zen-like, calm place, and without talking to each other, all made the same decision, we have to evacuate and we have to run. And uh, that was the wise decision. Now, if the next day they had to face something as adverse as that, you know, what would be in their bank account? I don't know, you know. So at all times, I think we, we really want to begin to think about the idea that the more that we cultivate this still quiet place inside of us, uh, the more we can access it at times that we need to make those wise decisions, that we need to stay calm. And things were very calm that day with these teachers and principals and kids. And I think that even, even then children's memory of that day was improved upon in terms of the story they're remembering as well. Mm -hmm. So it's all interconnected to me. Um, so about inner results, so I, I like to get very practical when we have these kind of panels and we've got 1,500 people here, is, um, so you think of, all right, so what are, what, are some of, what are some of the tools that you need? You're talking about being able to delay gratification. You're talking about being able to persist on challenges despite the fact that they're difficult. You're frustrated. You experience negative emotions, regulating emotions. It brings you back to kind of Walter Michel's study from the 70s with the, you know, we've got the marshmallows. Mm -hmm. Does the kid end up be able to sit there with the one marshmallow for seven minutes? Or do they kind of suck it down and just, you know, gavoon that thing because they can't wait? If they wait, they get two marshmallows. So I've got two six-year-old twins, and I'll talk to them about this. We were in the car. We got some donuts from Dunkin' Donuts. I don't know if they have Dunkin' Donuts in Australia. If they don't, that's awesome. You guys will be less obese than us Americans, <laughs> um, which is very easy. That's not low bar. Um, so, and what I would do is we were in the car, and they, were like, they asked me, like, Dad, could we eat in the car? I'm like, you can, but let me tell you about this study. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> And so we can know what's probably going to happen to you when you're in your 30s. Now, you're probably not thinking what's going to be in your 30s. I mean, you know, you know, again, I have kids, kids raised by psychologists. You get screwed up. This is what happens. <laughs> so I said, you're going to be you know, divorced. Dad, I'm not even married yet. Yeah, but it's not even going to work out well. And you haven't even found your partner yet. So you're going to have bad grades. You're, going to be, you're not going to get into the college you want to. You're not going to be a marine biologist. You're not going to become a veterinarian um, if you eat the donut. So... <laughs> 
<laughs> if you want, eat it. I mean, I don't care. I'm just like, it's your life. I mean, have the uh, authorities taken your children away because you're experimenting <laughs> on them? <or> the... <laughs> I think I have 11 more months left that I actually get the guardianship. Right. And so, so that day, obviously, they didn't eat the donuts. But what's cute is how often it comes up. It's become a meme with them. The marshmallow study, right? They know this. Mm -hmm. so the important thing is they're six. This is a sophisticated study. It's longitudinal. It doesn't have to be, though. They now have a meme of it's gone down to the marshmallow. And I'll say that. Like they're, when, they're, when they have a gift that someone sent them in the mail, and I said, listen, our aunt's not going to be here for another two weeks. Can you wait? And they say, oh, but I'm like, the marshmallow. <laughs> <laughs> right? So oh, it's just great. like, you know, it's great. am I cultivating resilient kids? Am I making them highly neurotic? Who knows? I'd be, <laughs> I'd be interested, um, Kate, because Beyond Blue has got a very important role to play in the management of anxiety and depression. And we seem to be seeing an escalation of depression and anxiety in the community and at younger age groups. And so education has been a big theme here. Do you think in the upbringing, the, the, is there a the depression anxiety in some way related to resilience and what kids are learning from a very early age? And if that's the case, then what would be your blue sky sort of vision of what you would do to remedy the problem. Some of the things that are really interesting here is your comments about depression and anxiety increasing are real, but what's really increasing in Australia, according to some recent studies we did, is anxiety. Depression's increasing, but at, you know, a couple of percent a year, which is a lot, but um, anxiety has increased by about 40% over the last six years in Australia. So anxiety disorders are a very real issue um, for, for, for our country, and they start really early. You know, this is primary school, you know, the kids that are... Um, that um, I've got stomach aches on Monday morning and, you know, things that, you know, that you just can't, you can't get a diagnosis on, but they're, they're just not right. Um, these kids are probably experiencing, you know, a level of anxiety. Now, I'm not trying to diagnose every child with a, with, with a, with a stomach ache at all, but we've got to understand that these things do start quite early. So um, in terms of the, you know, uh, the best outcome, a little bit it's around what Linda was talking about in terms mm -hmm. of schooling. We're lucky to have programs like Kids Matter in primary school and, and Beyond Blue, along with the Early Childhood Association and the Psychological Society of Australia, um, are at the moment trialling um, Kids Matter Early Childhood in early childhood centres. And fundamentally what that's about is building resilience. They're all about building resilience, including a program called Sensibility we have in high schools. We don't talk about depression or anxiety at all in these programs. Mm -hmm. What we try to do is give kids some um, kids and their parents um, the skill sets to be able to build resilience, to have better relationships. So in early childhood, it's about teachers being able to communicate better with parents, to be able to identify issues that might be happening with their kids, talk, ab talk about them and work out together how you might address them. Now that seems really simple, but it dramatically changes um, the outcomes for those kids. If you can get in early, if you can do it jointly um, with parents and teachers, um, and if you can give um, kids the skill sets they need um, to be able to deal with bullying, you know, all the, the, the nasty things that they will inevitably hit um, in, their, in their lives or in their schooling lives. We've got to give them the skill sets to be able to deal with those things, don't we? And we've got to do it early. Mm, yes. Yes, it, it, um, it, it seems strange that uh, in a period of relative economic affluence and comfort, certainly in, in a, yeah. a country like Australia, that um, uh, as things have become more comfortable, it seems perhaps like our level of resilience has actually narrowed. Maybe we've gotten too used to things being much more immediate than the way that we want it. Maybe our tolerance um, for uh, adversity and discomfort sort of reduced because we we don't sort of learn how to work with that at an early age. Craig, I just see yes, the dreaded clock sort of uh, yeah. winking at me anyway, if not you. Yeah. And I just wanted to th throw in another aspect of resilience, which is much more around sustainability and the triumph of human spirit in terms of achieving a goal and the satisfaction and pride that you get. And it's, a, it's not responding to adversity or anything in terms of just being strong in yourself, but just that determination that we see 
in sports situations or in, uh, in politics where people will drive through a, um, a policy to actually make a difference. And that's something that's very laudable. And in my book, I talk about the happiness that comes from the satisfaction and pride that comes from that kind of conceptualization of happiness. It's the, the looking back and reflecting, thinking of your achievements and the, what you've, uh, where you've, what you've um, built rather than just who you are. So I think we must remember that too, that um, resi resilience is, is the triumph of, you know, it's one of the most impressive aspects of humanity really, the resilience to keep on keeping on. And we see this all the time. And throughout this conference, we've seen people and collectively, we're all trying to pursue a vision of happiness and well-being being a primary aspect of um, social um, policy. And um, we need to keep on keeping on doing it. We need to collectively be resilient. Very good. So, can well, I throw a question out to the panel? Sure. I'm sure. I'm, you're I'm seriously over time. I'm, I'm going to be docked um, for yeah. oh, no, every okay, time. But no, you throw a comment in and I'll just pay the man out the back. So, yeah. Yeah. Time. Okay. Um, so just what, make it brief. Though. Yeah, yeah, no, no. One of the interesting things about resilience is, is if you think about the worst thing that another human being can do to another person, I think it's sexual assault and rape. And you find that 50% of women who are raped within six months afterwards, they return back to the same psychological function they were before it happened. It's an amazing statistic that people often don't believe. Because you have about 30 to 45% of people that go through adversity, or even 30 to 65% of people end up being resilient. My question is, how often when we sit on this panel and we, or we write our books or we give talks about this, do people end up feeling as if bad, like there's something wrong with them, that they're not in, what's the majority? The majority the modal response is resilience, not recovery and emotional problems. We're going to have to finish there, and I'd like if we could um, thank our panel. <laughs>